you be comfortable sharing your last 10 online purchases? I'm guessing not, and maybe this is one of the reasons you might be using or consider to use cryptocurrencies such as Bitcoin. But what if I told you that there are multiple internet service providers able to link your online purchases to you, not just your other purchases? Internet service providers can achieve this using the perimeter attack, which I will introduce in this talk. Concretely, the perimeter attack is a network layer attack that allows an adversary with access to the internet infrastructure to de-anonymize Bitcoin clients. Importantly, the perimeter attack is invisible. Thus, it entails no reputation cost for the attacker. Worse yet, while there is no cost for the attacker, her economic incentives are clear. Multiple transaction surveillance companies attempt to spy on all Bitcoin users, effectively creating a lucrative market for the perimeter attackers. While this attack is particularly dangerous for Bitcoin, its effectiveness demonstrates a more fundamental problem. And this problem is inherent to the way that we study cryptocurrencies and blockchain systems in general. I mean, our conceptual model for such systems is often something like the graph that is shown in the slide. Some number of nodes that are randomly connected to each other, forming a decentralized peer-to-peer -peer network. While this is a nice and handy model that allows us to prove multiple security properties, it is also quite deceiving as it only captures the application perspective. As a result, we often completely ignore the harsh operation reality, leaving dangerous and practical vulnerabilities behind. I mean, the Bitcoin system is just an overlay that is built on top of the Internet. And if we look at the Bitcoin network from the Internet perspective, the picture is quite different. The Bitcoin peer-to-peer -peer network is centralized to very few Internet service providers. And I'm not talking about the mining power, which is known to be centralized. I'm talking about the actual, the regular Bitcoin clients and their traffic, which propagates the Bitcoin transactions. Decentralization is a result of both the way that the Bitcoin network is operated and the way that traffic is routed over the Internet. Now, let me explain what I mean by centralization from the Internet perspective. As an illustration, in the y-axis of this graph, you see the cumulative percentage of Bitcoin traffic as a function of the number of networks intercepting it. You can think of a network as AT&T, Verizon or Comcast, but there are 60,000 of them in the Internet. Bitcoin traffic is obviously centralized to very few networks. For instance, 10 networks together intercept 80% of all Bitcoin traffic. Most importantly, this is not a property that is specific to Bitcoin. Indeed, Ethereum, for instance, demonstrate an even higher centralization from the Internet perspective. For instance, 10 networks together intercept 90% of all Ethereum traffic. Having described the different angles from which I look at cryptocurrencies, I'll now describe the perimeter attack, a network layer attack on the anonymity of cryptocurrencies. I'm Maria Postolaki, and this is joint work with Cedric Meyer and Laurent Van Beaver from ETH Zurich. This is the outline of my talk. I'll first give you some background information before I describe the attack procedure in more detail. Next, next, I will describe our key findings with regards to perimeter's accuracy and practicality. I will finish the talk with countermeasures after I have explained how the attack generalizes to other cryptocurrencies. So let's jump to the background. Bitcoin is pseudonymous. That means that users can perform transactions using a pseudonym that cannot be trivially mapped to their real-world identity. So when Alice, who is a perfectly physical person, buys something with Bitcoin, she instructs her Bitcoin node, say no day, to create a transaction containing her pseudonym. Observe here that no day 
uses the same IP to connect to the internet that Alice uses to connect to other services. Thus, connecting Alice's transaction to her IP is equivalent to mapping her transactions to her physical identity. This is exactly the goal of the perimeter attack, namely to map a user's IP to their transactions. This is extremely worrying, as it often allows the attacker to retrieve the user's full transaction history. Importantly, this is possible even if the user, Alice in our example, changes her pseudonym frequently, as prior research has shown. To understand the attack, let's go back to Node A, namely the Bitcoin client that Alice uses to use Bitcoin. Node A is connected to multiple other Bitcoin clients, in particular nodes B, C, D and E. Node A advertises any transaction it learns or generates to its peers. As such, when it creates the transaction 13, Node A advertises it to its peers using an inventory message which contains the corresponding hash. Nodes B, C, D, and E are unaware of the advertised transaction, thus they request it from node A by sending a get data message. Node A replies with a transaction. Observe that each transaction starts being propagated from the node that creates, created it. Obviously, this creates an opportunity for a potential adversary to trace each transaction back to its source. Indeed, multiple attacks have exploited the transaction broadcasting mechanism to map transaction to the IP of the nodes that created them. To that end, the attackers use one or multiple supernodes. Supernodes are seemingly regular nodes that connect to all active Bitcoin nodes and listen to the, adver to the transactions that they advertise. Next, the attacker recognizes the source of each transaction as the first or one of the first nodes that advertise this transaction to the supernode. While effective, such attacks are highly noticeable, as the supernode establishes 50 to more than 100 new connections to every reachable Bitcoin client. Importantly, such attacks can be mitigated by purely application-level countermeasures. For instance, the Bitcoin Core implements diffusion, a broadcast mechanism that instructs Bitcoin clients to advertise transactions with an independent exponential delay to its peer. This was done in an effect to make the previous de-anonymization attacks less effective. More recent mechanisms, namely Dandelion and Dandelion++, probably reduce the effectiveness of known de-anonymization attacks by splitting the broadcast procedure into two phases. However, both the attacks and the defenses operate at the application layer, effectively ignoring that all these transactions are broadcasted over the internet unencrypted. And the internet is composed of smaller networks which we call autonomous systems, or ASs. To understand the different attack vector and the inability of the application to mitigate it, let me explain how Node A communicates to the other peers via the Internet. Node A has an IP. Alice's provider, namely ASH, is responsible for creating a BGP advertisement covering this IP. BGP, the default Internet routing protocol, propagates this advertisement in the Internet until all ASs know how to read A's prefix. For instance, the Bitcoin client D, which is hosted in ASD, will connect to node A by ASs D and B and H's. Similarly, the nodes E, C and B connect to A via slightly different paths. Observe that ASB naturally and by naturally mean according to BGP, the default internet routing protocol, intercepts three out of four connections of node A, which is the victim. Note also that ASB did nothing to achieve this, she just happened to be in the path. Now, let's assume that ASB is malicious. 
from the application perspective, ASP has created the following situation. ASP has passively formed an incomplete circle around the victim. Having explained who the attacker is and how they have reached this state, I'll now describe the perimeter procedure. The attacker eavesdrops on the Bitcoin connections as intercepts. As the Bitcoin connections are unencrypted, the attacker can directly observe the propagated transactions. If the victim node has created a transaction, this will also be propagated. In this case, for instance, the victim has created transaction 13. Now, the challenge for the attacker is to distinguish the victim's transaction across all the transactions that the victim propagates. To achieve this, the perimeter attacker formulates this problem to an anomaly detection problem. Doing so allows the attacker to train directly on the traffic she observes. There are two key reasons why the victim's transactions appear as anomalies. First, the victim's transactions are a tiny minority compared to all transactions that the victim propagates. As a result, the attacker can learn the most common propagation pattern. Indeed, the victim's transactions will exhibit different propagation patterns. In particular, the victim's transactions will never be received by the victim, as the victim will never request them from its peers. Recall that a Bitcoin client only requests transactions it does not already know. Moreover, the victim's peers are more likely to request these transactions, as they are unlikely to have received them from a random peer before the victim, who is the actual creator. Similarly, we observe that the victim will receive less advertisements by its peers for its own transactions. Further, the attacker uses an isolation forest to solve the anomaly detection problem. An isolation forest is an unsupervised learning algorithm for anomaly detection that works on the principle of isolating anomalies instead of the most common technique of profiling normal points. Having explained the perimeter's procedure, let me now jump to its evaluation. We evaluated our attack in terms of accuracy and practicality. To evaluate the accuracy of our attack, we first run it in simulation. To that end, we used an event-driven simulator that I developed and contains all reachable Bitcoin clients. We augmented the simulation with delay measurements from RIPE Atlas. RIPE Atlas is a data collection system composed of a global network of devices called probes that can actively perform internet measurements. Finally, we used five-fold cross-validation for the future selection. We observe that the attacker does not need to intercept all connections to be accurate. In fact, intercepting just one-fourth of the victim's connections is enough to obtain an accuracy of 90% in the de-anonymization process in simulation. We also evaluated the accuracy of our attack by running it in the wild against our own client. Our client was connected to the live Bitcoin network and some of its connections were intercepted by the attacker. The attacker was storing the traffic for offline processing. During this offline processing, the attacker uses few minutes worth of traffic to train the isolation forest and the rest to find transactions that look as if they were generated by the victim. Again, we observe that the attacker does not need to intercept all connections to be accurate. This time, intercepting just one-fourth of the victim's connections is enough to obtain an accuracy of 70% in the de-anonymization process. Of course, the more connections the attacker sees, the more accurate she will be. While the accuracy of the attack is slightly higher in the simulation compared to the attack in the wild, the results are still worrying. We evaluated our attack in terms of practicality as well. To do so, we first had to infer the actual Bitcoin topology, which we augmented with internet routing information. We summarized our results in this graph. This graph shows the percentage of vulnerable clients as a function of the number of distinct network attackers that intercept at least 30% of their connections.
we observe that there are multiple attackers able to perform extremely powerful perimeter attacks against most of the Bitcoin clients. For instance, there are five distinct attackers that intercept at least 30% of the connections for 30% of the clients. Recall that each of these five attackers are able to de-anonymize the clients with at least 70% accuracy. Having explained the devastating effect of the perimeter attack in Bitcoin, I will now explain why the attack generalizes to other cryptocurrencies that are encrypted, such as Ethereum. In this case, the network attacker cannot directly read the exchange messages as traffic is encrypted. Still, she can infer the victim's connections. This is possible because only the payload of the packets traversing the internet is encrypted, but their headers travels in plain text. Next, the attacker uses her own client to connect to the victim's peers whose IPs she has passively learned. Prior research has shown that a node can be uniquely identified in a single session by its directly connected neighboring nodes. Notice from th that from the application perspective, the attacker has managed to create the following setting. She has again created a logical circle around the victim by connecting to its peers, whose IPs she learned by eavesdropping on the victim's connections. Importantly, the most common Ethereum client, namely Geth, does not implement any special broadcasting mechanism such as diffusion. This makes straightforward de-anonymization attacks that do no longer work in Bitcoin effective against Ethereum clients. While the effects of the perimeter attack are worrying, the perimeter attack can be mitigated with cross-level countermeasures. First, a node can select its peers in a routing-aware manner, namely, avoid the case that a single IS intercepts a large fraction of its connections. Second, another effective countermeasure is cross-layer monitoring. In particular, a client should monitor the performance of the underlying network to detect abrupt changes. For instance, the client might detect an increase in the propagation delay, which might indicate that someone is messing with its traffic. Another effective countermeasure is state obfuscation. A client could, for example, pretend that it's unaware of the transactions that it has generated by requesting them from its peers. Similarly, the client has incentives to obfuscate its peers by connecting to nodes to whom it does not interact with. This will be very useful against the perimeter attack if traffic is already encrypted. Finally, good old Tor and VPNs can effectively obfuscate client, a client's IP at the expense of performance. This was, would make the attack strictly harder as the attacker would need to first map the victim to the IP of the VPN or the tier, Tor relay that it uses. And with this, I concluded my talk. Thank you so much for watching and I'm looking forward for your questions.